Hi, this is Mark Rivera, music director for Ringo Starr and his all-star band, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program in which we talk about what's going on in the news with the Fab Four. I'm Ken Michaels, and some of you might know me for another Beatles program that I host syndicated around the world. It's called Every Little Thing. I'm being joined by Mr. Beatles Examiner himself and many Examiner columns, the man who never stops writing 24-7. His name is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Did, did you know I added another examiner column this week? You didn't know that, did you? And that makes how many? I think it's seven now. Okay. I added Weird Al Yankovic this week. Are you serious? I'm serious. You have a Weird Al Yankovic examiner column? Yes. Oh, yes. He's the man. <laughs> As somebody told me yesterday when, when I made the announcement. He definitely he definitely is. In fact, there's a, he's trending on Facebook today. I don't know if I'll write about what, it, what he's trending about, but I might I might just do that before the night's over. Well, it but, makes sense. First comes the Beatles, then we're now. Right. There we go. <laughs> it's the perfect combination. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, on our show today, we're going to talk about something, uh, some news that broke actually last week on July the 28th. It's big news for those of us who have been waiting for Paul McCartney remasters, and that is that the remasters for Venus and Mars... And Wings at the Speed of Sound are coming out, and they'll be out on September the 23rd in the U.S., and a day before that in the U.K. So, uh, Steve, good news right there. What are your thoughts about these particular two albums, and those are the next two to be remastered? Well, I mean, it, it you know, if he was going to do any, those are, those are two good choices. I'm su- kind of surprised he's throwing them on top of each other, because... For people who are going to buy the deluxe version, that's going to come into a, quite a bit of money. Hmm. But you know, it's a, it's good that he's getting these things out. A curious question is how long it's going to take him to finish this whole thing, because at this rate, it's going to be we're a lot we're, a lot of people are not going to be around to see the end of this <laughs> thing, and and a lot of people want to see, would love to see these, but. I'm glad that you know he's getting to the he's sticking with the earlier albums first and not worrying too much about the later ones. Mhm. Well, you got to figure he's got to do a couple at a time. If he does one one remaster a year, mm-hmm. you know, if he he's released over 30 albums and granted some of them have already come out remastered, but you're looking at over 20 years if you do one a year. You know, I'm not sure that every album needs to be reissued in this format. Especially the more recent ones, I wouldn't think, you know, you'd want to do that with, especially, you know, right away. But, you know, the earlier ones, the earlier ones, um, definitely, it's it's good that they're digging into the, um, you know, to the archives for this stuff. There's probably a lot more stuff on these two reissues that could have come out that isn't, which is really kind of, you know, they're being kind of skimpy on the audio, on the audio rarities, which is really too bad. Hmm. I've rarely ever encountered you being critical. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, if you look at, you know, there's only 14 tracks on the Venus and Mars bonus disc, and and seven tracks on the uh, at the speed of sound disc. I mean, could have done a little better with that, I think. Uh huh. But I'm sure there will be people that will buy it and will still be thrilled. And actually, you won't need to buy the the full books to get all that stuff anyway, you know, mm-hmm. the big deluxe things, you know, so. Well, to talk about a few points that you just mentioned, it makes more sense to go through the earlier stuff first, not necessarily because it's chronological, but probably those are the ones that need the most work audio-wise. Mm-hmm. And I do think that, you know, Paul McCartney is one of the greatest, if not the greatest artist we've had to the point where every single album that he's done deserves to be remastered. So we all have our own tastes, we all have our own favorites, and certainly the more recent ones, because the audio is going to be so much better on that, you have to wait 10, 20 years before those get remastered. That only makes sense. So um, that's what I have to say about that. 
Well, you know, you could always, even with the later albums, you know, dig out some unreleased tracks and throw them out, and and people would buy them. You wouldn't have to necessarily do a remaster for something like that. People will always, I mean, if you think about the, you know, the bootleg collectors, I mean, they'll buy anything, you know, if they haven't heard it before. And that, so if you were to put out, if you were to dig in, say, um, if you were to put out a, a you know, a expanded version of New Now, which actually there have been a couple, you know, in Japan, uh, or there was the one in Japan with the DVD, but, I mean, if you were to dig some tracks out of with New and maybe put out some of the live versions um, or do something, you know, do something weird like that, you know, there'd be people that would still buy those. Mm-hmm. And they'd appreciate not having to pay the high bootleg prices. Right, but I'm saying further on down the road, another 10, 20 years, it's oh. time to probably clean up the sound and make it sound even better. Sure. And uh, if you love this catalog or any particular catalog, and certainly the Beatles come into play, it, does, it wouldn't surprise me every 10, 15, 20 years if, if that catalog gets remastered again and again and again. Because it's that important. <laughs> you're going to scare the heck out of people if you say that, because um, obviously at some point down the road, something will happen when audio develops even more. And you know, um, But people have already been talking about Blu-ray, mm-hmm. um, Beatles on Blu-ray, and we haven't had that yet. And there, rumors are that there has been discussion about that. But of course, nothing's happened as of yet. Well, look, so, you've got fans out there who are content with what they got. And they may not care about getting the next improvement and then the next one. And then you've got the ones who are really audiophiles, and they, and they think if this is the greatest catalog ever, I want to hear it the best possible way for that time. Right. So that's going to go on and on. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Right. You know, the, the question is, what is the best possible way? I mean, were the Beatles remasters the best possible way? They've been sharply criticized by some people. So there's going to be criticism no matter what when it comes to the Beatles. Oh, true. Yeah, I mean, no matter you're right. No matter what you do, no, you know, there's always you're, you're right. You're ap- absolutely right about that. I mean, a good example of that is the the Japanese box that just came out. That is basically the USA box, you know, with a Japanese twist. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, there's nothing new there. It's all the same remastered tracks, except the track order and you know is in Japanese with Japanese booklet and all that stuff and the Japanese artwork. Basically, it's just an artwork uh, thing. Nothing really, nothing more. Right. But, and that's for the collector who has to have everything. Right. Even right. if they have these songs, you know, a thousand times over. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be those people that have to have that have to complete the collection. Mm-hmm. So. As far as what you were saying about the bonus audio, it's the only complaint that I've ever made about McCartney's remasters. I've always felt that he could give more. And certainly the packaging of his remastered CDs have been wonderful. He couldn't top wings over America. I thought Ram was amazing. I loved all that he put into He packed Ram, mm-hmm. just like he did with wings over, wings over America. But I've always felt that if you can store 80 minutes of music onto a CD... Give us 80 minutes of music or something close to it. And then there's always the issue of, and this is a debatable point, he's been putting singles or B-sides that came out at the same time as these albums, non, non-album non tracks, and making them part of the bonus audio. Mm-hmm. And some people love that. I mean, it, it associates the songs with that time when, when the album was recorded. And when it comes to something like Ram, for example... To put another day and a woman a why on there is a natural thing. Some people might look at that as padding the bonus audio CD. I personally would rather have a full CD of unreleased music, whether it's unreleased songs, alternate takes, different mixes, you name it. That's what I would prefer. But um, he's, he's putting the music on there, these A-sides and B-sides that were recorded around the same time. And in a way, I like it because chronologically it works and it makes you think what he was doing at that time during that, that album. So I like that in that regard. But, you know, it, it's, it's just a different way of presenting the music. You notice that when it came to the Beatles, all the albums were treated as separate entities to itself. They didn't put the singles that were released at the same time that weren't on the albums. 
You didn't have Sgt. Pepper with Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane on there. They could have went that route. They didn't do that. But for some reason, with McCartney, with the solo catalog, he is doing that. So in the case of uh, Venus and Mars, you've got Junior's Farm and Sally G, because it was recorded pretty close to the same time as the Venus and Mars sessions, even though it wasn't on the album. So it kind of makes sense. But do you like the idea of putting all these A-sides and B-sides of material that has already been released and reissued a few times over now, and putting it on, on the remasters. Well, I actually like coupling both of those discs together like that. And I and, and you were talking about Sgt. Pepper and Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. I, I think that would have been a great idea to do a, a special, you know, to do a, a, a special disc with, um, you know, Sgt. Pepper and, and uh, I mean, and uh, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields and maybe get some of the outtakes of Strawberry Fields. If you remember, and you may have to think back on this one, there was a, I had pictures on my old Abbey Road website of a, a proposed release of the Sgt. Pepper mono disc way back. Remember? Do you remember that? No, I don't. It's been, I think it was, God, I can't remember what year it was now. A long, long time ago. I'm sure some, some of the people listening will remember what I'm talking about. There was a Sgt. Pepper mono disc at one time that was in the works. And for whatever reason, and I don't know if it had anything to do with the fact that I wrote about it, it got shelved. And, you know, obviously they did it finally with the, with the uh, mono, uh, you know, the mono CDs. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there had been, that had been proposed a long time ago, but they didn't have any. As I recall, and I, I and I, it's been a while since I've seen that article. I don't recall if there was a second disc to it. I think it was just a first disc, a one, a single disc. Mm-hmm. But it was a box because it had inserts in it and everything. That I, that I do remember. But um, yeah, I mean, I I like this idea of coupling these things and, and putting everything together like that. I think it makes a great a great companion. The Bee Gees did the same thing with their studio albums, um, 1966 to 68, which is the first three albums. They had the uh, the first disc as a single uh, or stereo um, um, or mono versions of the original albums, and the second disc was all bonus tracks, hmm. including outtakes and singles and things like that. So, you know, I mean, this kind of thing has been done before, and it's, I, it, I think it works really well. So. Okay. Hey, for some people, they like the idea. Other people may not. Mm-hmm. You know, I just think that you've heard so much about how how much unreleased McCartney there is. I mean, think about all the alternate takes there must be <laughs> from the album sessions for all of his albums. And I'd love to hear some of that stuff. And we probably should just uh, very quickly go through what's on the bonus audio for both Venus and Mars and for uh, Speed of Sound. Uh, let's, let's just run them down real quick. For Venus and Mars, you've got Junior's Farm, Sally G, Walking in the Park with Eloise, and Bridge on the River Suite, which for those that don't know, that really was Wings under the pseudonym of the Country Hams, with uh, great uh, Nashville musicians on there, Floyd Kramer, the piano player, Chad Atkins, of course, on guitar. Walking in the Park with Eloise was a song that Paul's father wrote, um, and that was released as a single by the Country Hams. Uh, My Carnival, which uh, was recorded during the Venus and Mars sessions, wasn't released until it was uh, the B-side of Spies Like Us. Hey Diddle, the Ernie Winfrey mix. Don't know that one. I'm not sure if I know that one. Let's Love, the song that he wrote for Peggy Lee. Love to hear Paul's version of that. I'm hoping it's not the one from One Hand Clapping. Uh, There's a couple of tracks on here from One Hand Clapping, Soily and Babyface, and that I have to question because One Hand Clapping was released, the whole video was released, on Band on the Run. Uh, Lunchbox and Odd Socks, which was recorded around that time, but it wasn't released until it was on the uh, the flip side of the single coming up. Fourth of July is on here, and I'm really curious to hear this, because that's a song that uh, <laughs> I used to try and hunt down like crazy when I had the uh, Castleman and Pedrasic book of All Together Now. It was a song that, that uh, Paul wrote. Actually, I think it's Paul and Linda as, as a co-write. That was a single in 1974 for John Christie, 
and uh, you can easily hear the song now on YouTube. Uh, but it's a really nice uh, ballad from Paul. I've never heard a version of Paul doing it. Um, an old version of Rock Show is on there, and the single edit of Letting Go. 14 tracks in total. So um, it, it's it's a nice selection there. I just, you know, as someone who believes that there's got to be so much that was recorded there from all the different songs on Venus and Mars, I would have I would have really preferred to hear different takes and even different mixes of songs from Venus and Mars to add to that collection. I don't know if you really needed more from One Hand Clapping. How about you? I th- I think I disagree with you guys. To say it's a nice collection, I think, is over, is being a little too nice. I think it, it almost appears like kind of they threw it. They kind of threw it together. The fact that you know the the one hand clapping tracks are there, and let's let's assume for the moment that let's love comes from there, even though we're not positive. I mm-hmm. mean, it seems like they could have done a little better, and they could have gone a little deeper with that stuff. Um, we don't know what what he what they had access to, but it would appear to me that they could have done a little better with that one. Um, I, I think the the DVD, the bonus film, will be better. That'll be a lot more interesting because it'll have the, you know, Wings at Elstree and and, uh, and uh, recording my Carnival. I mean, that will be, you know, that will be more uh, a little more exciting, I think, than that bonus audio will. Right, you? and there's there's something on the DVD called Bon Voyageur. Mm-hmm. We don't know what that is. Right. And then there's the TV ad for Venus and Mars. Right. So there's four tracks on there, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I agree with you, Steve. And I do hope, that's a good point you brought up about Let's Love, I hope it's not the one from One Hand Clapping, because, like I said, that's already been released on on the DVD, mm-hmm. the bonus DVD of Band on the Run. So, um, you know, if it's just a, a separate recording, a complete recording of that song, that would be really nice to have. And as for Wings at the Speed of Sound... The bonus audio on that, you've got the demo of Silly Love Songs, the demo of She's My Baby, something called Message to Joe, and I'm guessing that's Joe English. Um, The most interesting thing of all, (laughs) Beware My Love, John Bonham version. I never knew that John Bonham was there during the sessions for Speed of Sound, but uh, we do know Paul's a big Led Zeppelin fan. So uh it'll be interesting to hear how he plays drums on that version. That's been getting a ton of discussion uh, and, and buzz. Everybody is dying to hear that. And I think a lot of people are going to buy that just for that, you know. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Just goes to show you, with all the material that comes out on McCartney, whatever books there are, nobody knows everything that he's recorded. Nope. <laughs> So things leak out like this. I've never heard any reference to John Bonham being on Beware My Love, there being a version of that. Mm-hmm. There's a version of Must Do Something About It. It says Paul's version. There has been a bootleg of Speed of Sound material with Paul singing that song, and I love that song. I think Joe English did an amazing job on vocals on that song, but it's nice to hear Paul sing it as Paul wrote it. Um, there's a demo for Let Him In. And there is an instrumental demo of Warm and Beautiful. So you've got seven tracks on Speed of Sound. So interesting material, but again, it seems rather thin on uh, when you can pack a whole CD with an hour or more of music. And, and again, you've got uh, the a bonus DVD that will add, you know, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of interesting material mm-hmm. with the two live wings. Uh, or assuming it says wings in Venice, I'm not sure that that may or may not be live. Wings over Wembley, I would think it probably is. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that in itself is going to be, you know, is going to be interesting. And the silly songs, silly love songs, music video, I'm guessing is probably the same thing from the uh, McCartney years collection. Yeah. But, so why they're repeating that, I don't know. Again. It seems like, and and with the with the only seven tracks of bonus audio, it seems like there could have been a lot more. And in fact, you could have cram probably crammed everything, all the audio on one CD and put out a second disc. But obviously, he's keeping the the album, you know, the album integrity by putting it on one disc. I'm not sure that that's an absolutely fantastic idea, but you know, what can you? Say? I mean. It would have been nice to have these two discs fully packed. 
it seems pretty obvious to me that Paul is very fussy about what he puts out. So, you know, he's he's very selective. He doesn't want to put out stuff that he thinks is below par or not interesting. And um, it shows in what he's released. And again, I love all the remastered CDs that he's put out. My only complaint has been mainly on the, the lack of bonus audio. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's really a shame. And you can go back to talking about the Beatles and how they often have the attitude that everything that was worth releasing is what they did release. So it's kind of a miracle that all the stuff on the Beatles anthology came out. But, um, you know, this this kind of stuff, if you're talking about someone who's willing to buy a deluxe, deluxe uh, remastered of, of any of McCartney's CDs, these are hardcore fans. These are fans who care about him, who are not going to worry so much whether or not an alternate take of the song is that good. They just want new material. They want something new to listen to that they haven't heard before and in the best quality possible. So uh, sometimes I think that Paul isn't aware of you know his audience. If you're going to spend, what is it, $70 for the deluxe version of either one of these packages, then those people are not going to care whether it's just the best unreleased stuff. They want as much as possible. And the fact that he's even putting out demos, demos in it, I mean, it's it's hard to make demos sound polished. Um, well, that's that's the charm of demos. Well, and but the, my point is that the sound quality of demos is normally is is generally less than produced tracks. And if you're hedging around putting out demos because they may not be, you know, perfect then why put out any at all? That depends on what demos you're talking about. You well, can have yeah, demos I, of just... I, I think, again, getting back to what you said about $70, people spending that kind of money aren't going to care. Especially, and, but on, you know, on the other hand, those people that will go out and buy bootlegs, for example, you were talking about the, the demos that have come out previously. I mean, some of that stuff sounded you know, horrible, but mm-hmm. you still sit there and listen to it fascinated. Right. Not that, you know... But not that you want um, to pay seventy dollars in here awful quality, but I, I, the, I, the point is that yeah, I mean you you were correct that you know there should be more of this stuff and they and they shouldn't really be so picky about what they're putting out. Um, it'd be nice to have a lot more mm-hmm. for, for this money. You know the 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 upside you know is that at least there are going to be you know, books, and uh, as there was with the, the Wings Over America set, which was absolutely gorgeous. Mm-hmm. You know, the books uh, um, there will be really nice. So, but boy, it sure would be nice to have a lot more. I agree. I agree. And I do love the packaging with all the different photos that Linda took through the years. And, and this particular, these two collections are going to have a McCartney interview in there, uh, a new Paul McCartney interview, and information about each individual track. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it no matter what. Yeah, uh, I, uh, you know, I got to say that, you know, as more of these, you know, anytime Paul digs out Linda pictures, it's it's really cool because she was, I mean, she was really great just, uh, with the camera. She was so good. You could just go on and on and on. Uh, I mean, anytime, it's, it's, she was really, you know, uh, extremely talented. She wasn't appreciated that much while she was alive as a you know until later on in life but you know back in the in the late 60s when she was doing it she never got the the appreciation really that she deserved right and she's getting it now and she just well deserve, she deserves that a lot and thank goodness she took photos of every single period <laughs> mm-hmm. you know we've got a lot to look back on that we've never seen before so right. uh and and that's one of the nice additions to any of these uh deluxe packages mm-hmm. so uh yeah so venus to mars and speed of sound coming out september 23rd in the u.s now interestingly enough and we haven't brought this up mainly because of the fact that it hasn't been officially announced but there is supposed to be a george harrison apple years box set in the works and the reason why we know about this is because Danny Harrison posted something on his Facebook page, actually the page of his band, the new number two, saying that he's been busy working on this with, uh, he puts the letters PH in there, which has to be Paul Hicks, a member of his band. Mm-hmm. And if you look at allmusic.com, 
not Amazon, at least at the time that we're recording this, there is a listing for this. And it's seven CDs and one DVD. And so I would think you're talking about everything from Wonderwall through and including Dark Horse and Extra Texture. And those are the only two titles in in George's uh, solo catalog that haven't been remastered. They came out on CD before, but they haven't been remastered yet. So um, if that does come out, and they're saying it's September 22nd, it's the same time as Paul's remasters. Well... I'm looking on Amazon right now. They are not listed. Mm-hmm. Or it is, I'm sorry, the Harrison box is not listed. So who knows? Um, but you have to think if Danny Harrison posted this. It's got to be happening. It may not happen on that date, but something's definitely in the works. Yeah. No, it, it it's not showing up at all for uh, September. So I'm guessing that we're only talking a month away. I, it, it'd be hard to imagine that they're going to, they're going to do it now. That's just my thinking. I don't well, see. when you say do it now, do you mean just for September, or will it, will it come out before the end of the year? It could still come out by the end of the year, sure. Um, but I'm. it's looking like it's not going to, you know, as of right now, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. But And it also see. says one DVD. And right. you can imagine what I'm thinking. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I know Something what you're Something on thinking. the 74 tour. Right. I hope I hope and pray that's what we're getting. But yeah, uh, I you know I agree with you. I I hope so too. But obviously, you know, if we're going to find out, I would assume we'll find out pretty soon. All right. One last thing we want to bring up, and that is Paul's upcoming concert at Candlestick Park. Well, he's got a cu- actually he's got a couple coming around. Uh, he's playing the uh, he's playing. Uh, Dodger uh, Stadium. He's, well, he's in Salt Lake City tomorrow. He's in Dodger Stadium on the tenth. Phoenix, and then he goes to Phoenix on the 12th, and then he hits San Francisco on the 14th. And it's too bad, obviously, with the 50th anniversary of Hollywood Bowl. He's not playing Hollywood Bowl. I'm guessing that, you know, they just haven't been able to, they weren't able to work out anything or, you know, dates, you know, they had date problems or something uh, going on there. Mm -hmm. But it's really great that he's going to be in San Francisco. It's, It's getting a lot of buzz. I know the local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, is running a special section on it this Sunday. I was out there recently and looked around, you know, in the in the locker room, and, and not much has changed since '66. <laughs> it, we were we were really kind of surprised how little had changed in there. Um, the stadium itself, outside, I shouldn't say outside, on the field is different because there was no center field bleacher. There was no center field. Seats at the time, the uh, stadium was open. It's not anymore, but it's still going to be cold. And I'm, I want to put out a word, and I've told you, but I'm going to put out a word to everybody listening. When you're coming to, if you're coming to that show, dress warmly. I'm not kidding. It's going to be cold. It, Candlestick has been known, even in the summer, to start chilling up around four o'clock in the afternoon. And we're talking a concert that's going to be at eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. It's going to be, you're going to need some coats, some coats. So don't, you know, don't dress, don't assume. I mean, everybody, I think, that comes to San Francisco knows that San Francisco is not warm anyway at night. But it's going to be, you know, dress warmly if you're coming out there. And even if it turns, you know, if it turns out that I'm completely wrong, you know, you'll be, you'll be glad. But if, if not, if I'm right, um, you'll be happy that you did. So. And also, and you had reported this within the last few days, um, the production company that Ron Howard is behind, and they're they're the producers for the upcoming, what we're being told is the Beatles Live Project, Mm -hmm. um, they're putting out the word, if anyone saw the Beatles at Candlestick Park in 66, to please get in contact with them and share their memories of Mm -hmm. that. Do you have the email address for people to contact? Yeah, let me me grab it. As a matter of fact... He um, he posted that on he posted my article on his Facebook page yesterday, which which was interesting I, when I found that out. Um, Ron yeah, Howard did. Ron Ron uh, Howard did. Wow, nice. Yes, he did. The address is Beatles Live at whitehorsepicks dot com. So if you have seen, if you saw the Beatles in '66, and you are especially if you are going next week. 
they want to hear from you. Okay. All right. So um, one last thing about this concert. You said you want to talk about predictions. Predictions? Well, yeah. he, I mean, he's been doing, you know, old songs from the from that tour and from that uh, set list anyway. He did. Uh, he's been doing Day Tripper. Paperback writer. Paperback writer. Yeah, it's it's it, everybody's you know wondering what he's going to do, but nobody seems to have have mentioned, or has the rumor seems to have dropped about Ringo showing up. Everybody suspects that Ringo's going to show up in L.A. I'm thinking, if anything, he's I'm thinking he'd be he's going to show up here in San Francisco. Hmm. Maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part, but that's my. I mean, this is, a, this is a big occasion, and if Ringo's going to show anywhere, you know, I think it's going to be in San Francisco. A couple things. Nobody seems to be mentioning this, and it may not be as important, but the fact that Paul is playing Dodger Stadium, people don't seem to make notice or take take notice of the fact that that was the next to last concert the Beatles played at. Right. And Paul's doing both Dodger Stadium and Candlestick Park. The other thing, I never really thought about Ringo joining Paul. Um, what I did think was that since the last song that the Beatles did in concert was Long Tall Sally, that that's something that Paul would do at this concert. Mm-hmm. It'd be really nice if it was the last song he did. Yeah. But uh, I'm that thinking would it would be somewhere in the encores, but probably wouldn't be the last song. Mm-hmm. And also, we should mention that since you brought up the Hollywood Bowl, there's been some talk about Bob Eubanks uh, putting together, and Dave Stewart of the Arrhythmics has been orchestrating a three-day event to time with the 50th anniversary of the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl of three days of concerts. Mm -hmm. And those three days are days that Paul and Ringo are not busy at all on stage. They don't have any concerts those three days. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking more along the lines of there may be a surprise there if, in fact, those concerts actually take place. Right. I don't know. I don't know. That actually seems less likely to me. But, again, you know, you never know. Um, only because the reason why it seems less likely is because there has not been any buzz about the Beatles, about McCartney at the Hollywood Bowl at all. And usually if something's going to happen like that, there is. And uh, like there was, for example, at, for example, at Radio City when he showed up for Ringo's birthday. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be fun if he showed up in both places. I'd kind of, I really kind of doubt that they would, you know, they won't do both. They won't, well, they'll there, were, there were reports about this three-day thing happening, and I heard about it a month ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been kind of quiet since. So, yeah, it has. Uh, I'm kind of curious about this. Yeah. You know, so uh, for such, uh, it's been described as like a monumental event with lots of stars who will be involved, and yet it's been kind of quiet ever since. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm hoping that some news will break very soon about this, but I'm only thinking only because Paul and Ringo don't have anything on their plate those three days that something could happen there. Right. So. One other thing that the we didn't mention, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this, but for anybody that was at the original Candlestick show or is just interested, there since Candlestick is being torn down, they are, there are two separate sales of items. One is the fact that they're selling pairs of seats from the stadium. You don't get to pick where, but they are selling seats. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually more of a baseball sports thing because – it's going through the San Francisco Giants and 49ers, and you can also buy for a couple hundred bucks more. You can get um, autographed seats from various people, including Willie Mays and you know Joe Montana and things like that. But then they're also a the company just announced uh, the other day that they're selling everything to the walls, and I'm talking about scoreboards, light fixtures, you know everything. So. I've had that. That information is on my Beatles Examiner page. If you're interested in finding out that, um, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're if you want a unique souvenir from Candlestick, there you go. All right. So if any of you want to get in touch with us, you can always write to us at our email address, Things We Said Today Radio Show at Gmail dot com. You can write to me, 
separately, if you prefer, at everylittlething at att.net. And you should also, if you can, please look at my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, for interviews with people connected to the Beatles and also weekly Beatles trivia. And Steve? You can get in touch with me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a Facebook page for my column. I have a personal Facebook page under my name that you can um, that you're welcome to come and and join and, talk and say hello and you know tell me you love the show and tell me you love my column or whatever and um, you know so uh, I, and I have am all over Facebook so always hanging around there doing something so and especially tell Steve that you love his Weird Al Yankovic there you go. column. Okay. Hey, please do. Subscribe. Can you get Weird Al on this show? I would love to have Weird Al. Actually, I just <laughs> did a, a recent story about Weird Al and the Beatles and his Beatle kind of, you know, his Beatle parodies. Mm-hmm. And he's done several. And I'm and some some of them are unreleased, of course. The one on every, McCartney. Everybody knows about uh, the song is just six words long. <laughs> but That's he's funny. also done he he did a uh uh, the chicken pot pie one about uh, uh, going off on Live and Let Die that Paul McCartney didn't want to give him permission for, but he's sung in concert anyway. You know, there's a whole bunch of, he's done a Free as a Bird one. He's, I mean, there's a whole bunch, there's a, a bunch of things that he's done. And I and think, he, I think Weird Al's album, his new album, hit number one recently. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. That's it all because first, of your article. It, yeah, I, I just, in fact, I just published an article yesterday. Um, that mentioned that, um, but yeah, he he hit number one, and it was the first comedy album since Alan Sherman. Oh my God! To hit number one, and Alan Sherman, of course, has a Beatle connection. Pop hates the Beatles. True, that's right. So there, you know, there there we go with that. But wow, uh, I would have thought Bill Cosby or Steve Martin or one of those I would people. Have, yeah, too. you would have. Been, it was surprising. I I went back through the list of number one albums. Uh, on Billboard to double check that, and yeah, nobody's gotten a, a number one. Hmm. Nobody right. is nineteen. Yeah, it was all the way back in '63. So, and hmm. he did it twice that year. I found out yesterday, not just once. Well, I was brought up on those albums, believe me. <laughs> mhm. Yeah, no, he's he's he was quite a guy. He was he was on. In fact, I believe somewhere I've seen clips of him on Ed Sullivan. He was on Ed Sullivan, so. You know, whenever, as was everybody back then, but yeah. Whenever I hear the songs that he's parroting, I hear Alan's lyrics. <laughs> mm. I substitute his lyrics. So, anyway, so this has been fun. Talking about the McCartney remasters. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, thanking all of you for listening. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying... Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. 